I'd just like to uh, begin by thanking Jan for <clears throat> a really nice introduction. And um, maybe I should say that, that actually when I did refuse to take my GRE exams many years ago, I'm gratified to see that this year was the first year that Rockefeller University decided not to require GREs for any of its student applicants. Some years later, I think universities finally got it that exams really don't mean that much after all. <laughs> In any case, it's a real pleasure and it's, uh, it's a special delight to be um, amongst friends and colleagues uh, who I've gotten to know for uh, the last number of years serving uh, on the um, SAB for IMBA. I always like to start off my audience uh, by um, reminding you that uh, even though I've been interested in uh, skin for a number of years that um, you too have been, I'll do this, that you too have been interested in uh, skin and I uh, usually like to use one of the more uh, recent vacations that I've taken, this one in Tanzania, to remind you that nature clearly has had a lot more fun and fancy in creating body surfaces than she has in creating any of the ugly organs that most of you work on. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and basically, we don't go that much deeper into the skin. Um, we go to the skin epithelium. And the skin epithelium is really one of the body's not only largest organs, but it's also one of the primary uh, environmental interfaces. It's subjected to all sorts of various different noxious agents, pathogens, mechanical stress, wounds, oncogenic stress, and so on and so forth, insect bites if you happen to come from Tanzania. And there's really a plethora of uh, stem cells, but also 20 billion uh, T cells and innate immune cells that help these stem cells cope with stresses. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. The topics that I would like to cover uh, is how does the um, <coughs> epidermis and its appendages, how are these cells made? How are the, how's the tissue structure made? How are the stem cells born? What does that mean? Where are the tissue stem cells um, that are residing within the skin that are important in replenishing the epidermis and also repairing wounds and dealing with all these stresses? And how are they maintained in normal homeostasis? And then how do the stem cells respond to injury? How do they survive oncogenic stresses? How do they survive and cope with inflammatory stresses? We'll start with the first, um, dealing with how the epidermis and its appendages are made. And I always think that it's uh, basically um, a process of building a wall. And um, effectively, you've probably um, come across uh, more uh, recent um, efforts to build walls uh, and perhaps tear them down or perhaps not build them at all. It's generally a bad idea unless there are billions of years of evolution that basically demonstrate that a wall is something that is a good thing. And uh, we have those billions of years of evolution with regards to the epidermis. And in fact, forming uh, a barrier tissue is a conserved feature across organismal development. But different organisms do it differently. Insects have only a single epidermal layer. They secrete cuticle that basically forms this hard barrier surface to the body. Mammalian epidermis, on the other hand, starts with a single layer of progenitor cells or stem cells, and then they differentiate to make multiple layers, and the layers then form the barrier. Uh, when we focused on using mouse as a model system, we are interested in the following properties, because you start right after gastrulation, the skin epithelium exists as a single layered epithelium, and um, at nine and a half days of development, it's a very tiny little thing. And I think, I don't know if I can do the lights down, but we might need some of these lights a bit down in front. Within a, a period of development for uh, the mammal, and the, the mouse is born shortly after 18 and a half days, about 19 and a half to 20 days of development, there's a, a 30 fold expansion in surface area growth. And during that time, not only does the epidermis have to grow from one single layer and expand to fill that uh, coverage of the tissue, but also 
uh, there has to be a process of uh, stratification and differentiation. And that involves, <laughs> it turns out, uh, not only symmetric divisions to expand the layer of uh, stem cells, but also of asymmetric uh, cell divisions to be able to produce the stratified layers of the epithelium. So what happens if there's a defect that arises early on in development? If the bad cell is not cleared from that developing epidermis, then it's going to expand, form a clone, and basically compromise tissue fitness. And so the first story that I'd like to tell you about with regards to making the epidermis comes from the work of Stephanie Ellis, a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory, and this work is currently in press. And if we go back to fly biology, there are three key principles that underlie cell competition in flies, and that's indeed what we're talking about here. The idea is that the less fit loser cells are going to be selected against during the course of epidermal development, and the more fit winner cells are going to be selected for. And how does that happen? Well, in flies, the three key principles of how this happens are the following. First, there has to be a growth differential between neighboring clones. So the good cells have to be able to grow better than the bad cells. There has to be an active elimination of the less fit cells by the more fit cells. And that active elimination involves uh, basically a situation where the loser gets recognized by the winner and basically takes care of the loser. And, and then the other aspect of cell competition is that loser-winner status is relative to the neighboring cells. That is, if there's a loser cell in a sea of loser clones, nobody recognizes it as being a loser. And so the idea here is, for instance, if you take a genetic background, such as a heterozygous NMIC background, and MIC NMIC is dispensable in the mouse, that basically if you put it around a bunch of NMIC null cells, then NMIC heterozygote is going to be recognized as the winner. But if you take that exact same cell, only now you put it surrounding wild-type cells, now NMIC is going to be, uh, the heterozygote is going to be recognized as the loser. So that's the idea behind cell competition. And in order to be able to understand or study cell competition in the mammal, we need to have a system where we can develop epidermal mosaic clones much the same way that has been done in flies. We came up with a method about 10 years ago that allows us not only to develop uh, epidermal mosaic clones, but also to carry out very complicated genetics and also high throughput functional analysis in mice, much the same way that's done in worms or flies. And the way in which we do that is we take advantage of the fact that right after gastrulation, that skin exists as one single layer of unspecified multipotent progenitors, and that if we simply expose the embryo at that age to uh, lentivirus, that lentivirus within 24 hours rapidly integrates into the very first cell layer that it sees and thereafter is stably propagated. And so uh, effectively, we do this in living embryos so that um, if, in this case, we look uh, some six days later, what we see is very good transduction of the skin epithelium and everything that the lentivirus is packaged with, which is basically H2B RFP at this stage. There's stratified epidermis that is formed, and the hair follicles have formed now. And there are about 65 different cell types in the adult skin, and the epithelium is the only one that is targeted using this approach. And so this really allows us very powerful uh, genetics to be able to keep up with the high throughput analysis that's done at the genome level or the RNA sequencing level. It also then allows us to be able to ask these kinds of questions, such as how do loser cells get cleared out by uh, winner cells. And so uh, effectively, if we now take a look just a few days later in mouse skin development, what we find is that there's still largely a single layer of uh, epidermis. And if we look at how and whether competition exists, we find that indeed it does exist. And it's dependent upon the apoptotic bodies of the loser cells being engulfed 
by the neighboring winter cells. And the adjacent winter cells then really kill and engulf the uh, loser cells. And so we've worked out the genetics. The genetics is very similar to what happens in cell competition in flies, uh, such as in fly wing development, which also involves a single layer of epidermal cells. What's interesting as well is that if we now follow this into uh, what happens when the skin epithelium stratifies at 17 and a half days of development, now we don't have a Drosophila counterpart. And we looked at this and what we found is that cell competition still occurs, but now basically mammalian development and evolution have come up with a new way in which to clear out loser cells. And in this case now, the loser cells don't get cleared out by apoptotic uh, attack and uh, engulfment, but rather in this case, the loser cells are eliminated by virtue of this ability to uh, asymmetrically divide and differentiate and uh, ultimately clear out the losers in that regard. We've shown also that if you don't have these mechanisms, either at 12 and a half days or 17 and a half days, to clear out loser cells, that what happens is that the fitness of the tissue ends up suffering. I suspect that one is going to see this kind of mechanism or these kinds of mechanisms come into play in a variety of other tissues that have to develop because all tissues have to deal with this fundamental problem of in early development, uh, organs and tissues are expanding rapidly and you have to be able to have some mechanism to clear out loser cells. And of course, there's also uh, this issue that comes into play in terms of later on in um, malignancy. So with regards to development, uh, we've also been studying how uh, appendages form. And one of the things that's universal about the formation of an appendage, whether it's a hair follicle or a sweat gland or a mammary gland for that matter, is that the development of that initial epithelial bud is dependent upon wince, and that during that single layer of development, uh, some cells end up with higher levels of wince signaling than other cells. Those cells end up clustering by mechanisms that we still don't fully understand. And when those cells cluster, uh, they start to asymmetrically divide perpendicular to the basement membrane. And that leads, in this case, of the development of the hair follicle to the formation of two daughter cells, one of which is uh, going to be in a went low state and the other cell that's going to be in a went high state. And in addition, what happens is that the cell that is went high ends up producing sonic hedgehog and it is the cell that is went low that ends up receiving the sonic hedgehog signal. That again increases the differentiation of these two cells and uh, ending up with the two initial cells that start to form the hair follicle. We've lineage traced these went low cells and they are the cells that end up in the adult stem cells in their niche. So if we then move on to say what happens in the adult where during embryogenesis, stem cells are formed and then they're set aside to be utilized later in terms of tissue replacement uh, and in terms of wound repair. And if we take a look at what happens in the adult epithelium, what we find is that, again, we see that not only are these uh, cells initially specified to give rise either to the epidermis or to the hair follicle or to one of its appendages, but so too in the adult do we find that there are discrete stem cell compartments for these different stem cells. And what's interesting, however, is that they all have that common embryonic origin and for all practical purposes, these stem cells are all acting the same, except they don't act the same. And the reason why they don't is due to the fact that their neighbors or their niche, their microenvironment, is basically dictating or influencing how these stem cells behave. It influences the molecular biology, the gene expression patterns of these stem cells, and it also uh, influences whether or not these stem cells are, for instance, going to differentiate and give rise to the epidermis or to uh, be involved in hair regeneration. And I think that's an interesting principle, and it's one that, again, uh, is bearing itself out in other stem cell compartments. <clears throat>
that it's really niche stem cell interactions that influence how stem cells behave and act. So we've been studying the hair follicle because in the mouse, uh, the mouse hair follicles, every single one of the hair follicles has a stem cell niche. And during early postnatal development, these stem cells are all doing the same thing at the same time. They're either sitting there in quiescence, not making hair, or they're actively cranking out hair. And so it's the perfect system to really be able to study how stem cells act in quiescence and how stem cells transition to actively making tissue. And in this case, it's tissue generation without a wound-induced environment. We know that the stem cell niche is sending out high levels of BMP. That's an inhibitory cue. We know that at the base of the niche, there is a buildup of Wnt signals and BMP inhibitory signals through interactions between the stem cells at the base with specialized mesenchyme called the dermal papillae. And that's really what sets these stem cells into a tissue activating mode where they show nuclear beta catenin, change their program of gene expression, asymmetrically cell divide, and give rise to cells that are basically Wnt high and sonic hedgehog producing as well as still the quiescent stem cells. There are two papers that we published over the last five years that I think are important papers. One of them is a paper that we published last year taking advantage of the fact that the stem cells and their tissue regeneration capacity is all spatially and temporally well defined. And so we can apply single cell uh, sequencing technology to be able to really understand the functional significance of the heterogeneity that develops. And what we found is that the stem cells, the quiescent stem cells, are all fairly homogeneous. The heterogeneity develops down here at the base. And what we learned is that those initial uh, divisions are asymmetric relative to the basement membrane. So really drawing upon some of the early steps that are happening in embryogenesis but now happening within a stem cell niche. In addition, we uh, published another important paper that really emphasized that to be able to understand how stem cells interact with their niche, that one really has to not only use uh, conditional knockout technology to look at what the functional significance of the ligand is, but also to look at who are the cells that are basically responding to that ligand? And in so doing, what we showed is that Sonic acts in two ways. It acts on the mesenchyme to elevate the level of proactivating factors that are going to stimulate hair growth. And it also then acts on the stem cells, the quiescent stem cells, to restock the stem cells that are utilized in tissue growth and also to stimulate their production of the shaft that then pushes the signaling center away from the niche. The niche then returns to quiescence very quickly. And down here, the signaling center, through producing the hair follicle, has now started to change the, the complexity of the niche microenvironment. And as that complexity changes, so too does the behavior of these progenitor cells. In this paper, we also generated lineage uh, temporal lineage-specific Cree drivers to be able to unfold the process of stem cell progenitor relationships. And we also applied chromatin landscaping to be able to look at what's happening at the level of gene expression. And what we learned from that study is that the early uh, progenitors that are formed from stem cells are multipotent. They have the capacity to differentiate into multiple different cell layers. But then, as the complexity of the niche interactions change during the course of, in this case, tissue regeneration, now that uh, the stem cell progenitors end up being more and more restricted in what they can do until what we're left with are uh, effectively eight different progenitors that are giving rise to eight different types of asymmetric cell divisions giving rise to the complex eight layers of the hair follicle. So the hair follicle is basically as complex as the hematopoietic system. It's just all spatially and temporally well-defined. So 
We've also looked at how these various different signals then are manifested to control the behavior that these stem cells have. And we learned that in BMP signaling, that there's a cascade of transcription factors that are produced downstream, and that that's involved in controlling quiescence, as I mentioned to you. And we've looked at what happens with hair regeneration. And uh, for those of you who are a little bit older, you probably noticed that your hairs grow a little bit less well with age than they did uh, when you were younger. And uh, effectively, what that's due to in the mouse, and we don't know that whether the case is in the humans, but in the mouse, it's due to the increased levels of BMP that happen between intervals of uh, quiescence between hair growth. And those intervals get longer and longer, and it turns out that uh, in older animals, it is predominantly very high levels of BMP that accumulate in the fat of these older animals that is responsible for uh, controlling quiescence. I'll also mention that hair graying is another uh, aspect that does involve stress as well as, uh, as BMP, but basically, uh, the reason why hairs also gray with age is that the hair follicle uh, stem cells that exist in that niche, the melanocyte stem cells also exist in that niche. And the system has to be coordinated so that the two stem cells have to respond to the same signals, receive their differentiation cues, such that the differentiating melanocyte can now transfer its pigment to the differentiating hair cell. And that's what gives the hair its pigment. So uh, whenever um, one manipulates, for instance, BMP signaling, uh, it affects um, uh, the, uh, this, the hair regeneration process, so too are we affecting the melanocyte stem cells. And so with regards to that, uh, one of my graduate students who just recently graduated had this brilliant idea of basically uh, creating a lot of money, but also at the same time, generating the fountain of youth by virtue of knocking out some of these transcription factors that are involved in quiescence. Indeed, it worked beautifully initially because when we looked at the hair cycles, what we began to realize is that these animals just don't, the hair follicles just don't go through quiescence for any extended length of time. They're cranking out hair. Every time they finish one hair cycle, they start another one. Um, and so for a while, that really did look like we had uh, come up with the answer until these animals started to get older. And in fact, they lost their hair quicker and they grayed their hair quicker. And so these data told us something important because uh, we don't yet know whether it's the stem cells or whether it's their niche that basically breaks down with age. Our suspicion is that it's actually the niche cells that are breaking down with age and that ultimately then uh, doesn't allow us to correct the problem simply by activating more uh, regularly the stem cells. So we've also <clears throat> used conditional knockout technology to knock out each of these transcription factors. I won't go through them uh, in detail because we've published these papers now over the last 10 years. But effectively, what we learned from knocking out the different transcription factors that are non-BMP regulatory factors that are involved in uh, in the RNA sequencing of these stem cells um, is essentially that they're all involved in repressing some aspect of differentiation, whether it be sebaceous gland differentiation or epidermal differentiation. We knocked out TCF3 and 4, which are the two transcription factors that are DNA effectors for Wnt signaling. They antagonize Wnt signaling, so if you knock out beta-catenin, you get no hair growth. If you knock out TCF3 and 4, you get precocious hair growth. And I'll show you uh, why that works in a minute. We also then knocked out the other two factors that are DNA effectors of Wnt signaling. They act downstream in those early progenitors that I mentioned to you, uh, those sonic hedgehog producing progenitors. And it turns out that when you knock those out, that they act coordinately with beta-catenin to be able to drive progenitor growth. So you can't look at just the DNA effectors and know which way Wnt signaling is going to act. It really is context dependent. So two of my graduate students uh, looked at the simple question of whether or not this whole cohort of transcription factors 
that are expressed in these stem cells in their quiescent niche, could they be acting together on some common group of genes that might regulate stem cell function? And when we looked at that, what we found is that there's only about 5% of all the genes that are expressed by the hair follicle stem cells that are regulated in this way, but it's an important 5%. It includes the transcription factor genes themselves. It includes the BMPs, the BMP receptors, the Wnt inhibitors, the Wnt receptors, and so on and so forth. So a very rich list of genes, but only a small fraction of all the genes expressed by the hair follicle stem cells. And those genes are regulated by large open chromatin domains. Rick Young refers to them as super enhancers, very large stretches of open chromatin within which we find short stretches of DNA that bind all the various different transcription factors that are expressed by the hair follicle stem cells in quiescence. They bind mediator, which brings the promoter and enhancer together, and they bind certain active uh, histone marks. And they also have the sequence motifs for the binding of these factors. But if we now look at the DNA effectors, these signals, the BMP signals and the Wnt inhibitors that these stem cells are responding to, what we find is they too, their DNA effectors, also bind to these same small stretches of DNA. The phosphosmad one binds to those stretches, and TCF3 and TCF4, which are the DNA effectors uh, antagonistically for Wnt signaling for the stem cells, are also bound in those regions. And so, effectively, what that makes these short stretches of DNA embedded within these super enhancers, what that makes them are molecular zip codes, if you will. They're basically platforms for the binding not only of all the transcription factors that are expressed by a stem cell in its quiescent state, but also for the signals that these stem cells are responding to. Effectively, this is who I am, a stem cell, and this is who I am, or this is where I am in a quiescent stem cell niche. And so now I'd like to move to this how do stem cells respond to culture and injury, and it turns out the culture is basically a mimic of injury. We've known for quite a few years that if we isolate these stem cells and we put these stem cells into tissue culture, that those stem cells will now go from quiescence to active division. They'll grow very rapidly. We can transfer them. And if we clone them or put them back onto a mouse, in this case, a mouse that needs hair, uh, basically, it'll make hair, it'll also make sebaceous glands and epidermis. These broader lineage options that are afforded to the stem cells might again be an indication for you that these stem cells are by and large all the same, it's just that they're responding differently to their microenvironment. And it turns out that the big difference of how these stem cells change is rooted at the level of super enhancer dynamics. So again, those 350 genes, many of them are turned off in vitro. Uh, only a small fraction remain on, and now a new fraction of super enhancer regulated genes turns on. And it turns out that that new super enhancer regulated gene cohort is regulated by Wnt induced transcription factors that are elevated when we're putting the stem cells into serum rich, growth factor rich media. And it turns out that we also see vestiges of um, both uh, the wound-induced transcription factors and also the stem cell transcription factors. But now they're both epidermal stem cell and hair follicle stem cell <laughs> transcription factors that are all on co-regulating that new group of super enhancers. We call this a state of lineage and fidelity state, and it turns out to be important. It is also mimicked in wound induced stem cells that now are forced to migrate up and repair the epidermis, for instance. And it turns out that while these stem cells are outside of their niche, they're in limbo. And in order for them to survive outside of their niche, they have to change this small cohort of genes in order to be able to survive. And if you look at what those genes are, many of them are survival genes. So, we can exploit 
what I've just told you in terms of our chromatin landscaping to ask, is that functionally important? And the way in which we've done this, again, exploits our ability to do rapid mouse genetics. We can simply take out one of those regulatory elements that has all of the components, bells and whistles, and use it to drive EGFP. And in mice, if we do that for uh, a quiescent super enhancer regulatory element, we find only in the stem cells, that single layer of stem cells, uh, and only in its quiescent niche do we find that this gene is expressed. We put the stem cells into culture, it turns off the gene, we graft the stem cells back on, they reform their niche, the gene turns back on again. Similarly, if we take one of those culture regulatory elements and we do the same thing, in the unwounded state, no activity. In the wounded state, we now see activity. And again, once the wound is resolved, the activity turns off again. So these really are molecular zip codes. They're not saying, I'm a stem cell. They're saying, I'm a stem cell, and this is the microenvironment that I'm in. And that's what really distinguishes these super enhancers from the uh, regular uh, enhancers and the regular genes that are expressed. So now you begin to see the importance of the microenvironment on dictating the properties of the stem cells. So we then want to focus on how do stem cells survive oncogenic stress? And indeed, uh, it's been demonstrated by several of my former postdocs over the years that stem cells from the epidermis and stem cells from the hair follicle, when they accumulate mutations, can indeed give rise to ultimately what will become squamous cell carcinomas, uh, which is the type of cancer that we work on. And so uh, the first thing that we wanted to do is to look at what hap happens when the stem cells first begin to experience these changes in gene expression that are ultimately going to drive them to malignancy. And what we found is a very interesting aspect, and that is that these stem cells in their oncogenic state adopt this lineage infidelity that's very characteristic of the wound repair state that we had been studying. And this just shows you an example, actually, of a, a squamous cell carcinoma of the skin that's metastasized to the lung. And it expresses signs of both the epidermal stem cells and the hair follicle stem cells in the lung in the met metastatic state. To what extent, then, is cancer really a wound that never heals? Well, at the epigenetic level, it turns out to be that not only is this dual lineage infidelity state seen, and by the way, when we use CRISPR-Cas technology, what we've shown is that lineage <coughs> infidelity is essential for these stem cells. When we knock out these various transcription factors and disrupt lineage infidelity, then the stem cells can't survive. They are slow to heal their wounds, and, uh, and basically uh, malignancy is arrested. What's different, though, is that lineage infidelity becomes permanent in cancer. It's transient and resolves itself in a wound. And the reason for that turns out to be rooted in the RASMAP kinase pathway, where we've demonstrated that uh, in a wound, RASMAP kinase is transiently induced and then resolved once the stem cell has now become an epidermal stem cell as opposed to a hair follicle stem cell. Whereas in malignancy, RAS is the main driver of uh, squamous cell carcinomas, whether it's KRAS in lung squamous cell carcinomas or whether it's uh, HRAS in, uh, in skin squamous cell carcinomas. <clears throat> and when you look at the epigenetic level, you find, again, the parallels between the early steps of wound repair and the steps of malignancy striking where uh, the wound-induced chromatin marks are basically also seen in malignant stem cells. But now you see new open chromatin marks. And when we take a look at those open chromatin marks, they also show signs of the lineage and fidelity state, as well as uh, always invariably ETS. <clears throat> and ETS is the target, is a substrate of the RASMAP kinase and when it's phosphorylated, basically drives ETS in a hyperconstitutive state. So we're also beginning to understand, then, the relationship between uh, the mechanisms of wound repair and the mechanisms of cancer. And again, 
we can dissect out what we've learned at the level of epigenetics. And I should mention that all of the epigenetics that we do are straight out of the fax machine uh, doing either in vivo RNA-seq or single cell sequencing or doing chromatin landscaping. And so again, now if we cut out one of those regulatory elements that is only seen in cancer and not seen in the wound-induced state, what we find is in unwounded skin, no activity, in wounded skin, no activity. But now during malignant progression, now we start to see uh, the activity of this uh, reporter. And so effectively, not only do these kinds of methods allow us to drill deeper into verifying the chromatin landscaping that we're seeing and dissecting out or teasing out the functional significance, but as you can see, it also allows us to develop new drivers. With each one of these drivers, we now have the tools to be able to dig deeper into understanding stem cells during injury repair and during cancer development. And so um, with regards to uh, genetics and the microenvironment, the mutations that are ultimately going to give rise to a malignant state for the stem cell uh, will eventually override. They'll override some of the various different mechanisms that stem cells normally respond to to be able to uh, have uh, or exert their behavior. But even in the course of malignancy, the microenvironment still matters. And so we were really interested in this and surprised some years ago as we isolated the stem cells that are giving rise to the squamous cell carcinomas. And for this, um, I'm referring to a cancer stem cell as basically a tumor initiating cell. We're taking fractionated cells out of a squamous cell carcinoma, introducing them into a host recipient uh, uh, animal and basically looking for squamous cell carcinoma. And so at the single cell level, we can basically identify cells that are uh, tumor initiating cells for the cancer. And when we take a look at where they are, they too are at the stromal uh, tissue interface. So very similar effectively into what we're seeing in the normal stem cell environment, only now the stroma is completely different. There are cancer activated fibroblasts, there are immune cells, there are blood vessels. And so we began to look at the microenvironment and we realized that the microenvironment changes in this dynamic for a cancer. And wherever there's a blood vessel that comes up next to the tumor as it's undergoing angiogenesis, that these tumor initiating stem cells end up receiving what is a very high level of active TGF beta signal that comes from the perivasculature of the microenvironment. And so that then ends up impacting the behavior of these tumor initiating stem cells. And so to be able to understand how the stem cells are responding to these different microenvironmental cues, we wanted, in this case, to develop a bells and whistles lentivirus that allow us to look at this. And what we did is uh, basically in the lentivirus package in a constitutively active uh, transcriptional, uh, tetracycline inducible transcriptional activator. We packaged into it a uh, large gene, but that gene is basically all under control of a TGF beta responsive element driving a fluorescent cherry and driving a tamoxifen inducible Cree ER. And then we also put a hairpin to be able to knock out whatever gene we wanted uh, to look at functional relevance of whatever we might find. So the way in which this works now is let's go back to our embryo. And in nine and a half days, we're going to now use lentivirus, but lentivirus at very low titer. We're going to put it into embryos that harbor a inducible Harvey Ras gene under a tetracycline inducible regulatory element and a lineage tracer driver uh, that requires excision by Cree recombinase in order to be activated. And so the idea is that the lentiviral titer now is going to control how many tumors we create, and we can decide when we want to create them in the animal. So you just let the animal grow up and nothing goes on, nothing happens. We now start to add doxycycline to the animal's diet. We turn on the uh, RAS oncogene, start to develop tumors only in those clonal patches that receive the lentivirus because they're the ones that can drive 
uh, the tetracycline activator. And now wherever there's a blood vessel effectively bringing the TGF-beta signal, we start to see M-cherry. Those cells are the only cells that have the capacity of activating Cre. And now if we give the uh, animal tamoxifen, we can induce that Cre in these TGF-beta responding cells. And that allows us to lineage trace and say, what are these cells doing when they receive a TGF-beta signal? So again, using these kinds of fancy genetics in a poor man's genetics way, we can really start to drill down and effectively ask whatever question we want and be able to use mouse as a model system to address it. And so this is what happens then. So the tumor then develops. There's a blood vessel over here. All the tumor initiating cells light up with them cherry, no blood vessel over here, no cherry. Uh, and we can isolate the two populations of cells and we show that the cells receiving a TGF-beta signal don't grow as fast as the cells that don't have one. And so you might think that's an advantage then not to have a blood vessel because these cells are gonna grow like gangbusters. They're gonna produce the bulk of the tumor, but there's a different side to their microenvironmental changes, and that is that the cells receiving a TGF-beta signal break down the basement membrane and they are the ones that invade. And remember the blood vessel, so we think that these cells then get into the bloodstream and are responsible for metastasis. And so this then allows us to show that within a developing tumor, there's heterogeneity that is due to the microenvironment, the tumor microenvironment that is impacting dramatically the behavior of these tumor initiating stem cells. Does it matter? It turns out to matter a lot because if we now take a look at, uh, at what happens when these tumors respond to cisplatin, which is the drug of choice for head and neck cancer, for instance, blue shows that we wipe out the bulk of the tumor very quickly. The red cells are the TGF-beta responding stem cells. They're spared from apoptosis. And if we lineage trace, wash out the cisplatin, and then activate our lineage tracing marker, we can say, well, uh, are those cells really under the radar screen of the chemotherapy? And they are. They are the cells responsible for tumor relapse. We've worked out the mechanisms of what's going on with regards to TGF-beta. I won't go through them because we published them several years ago, but basically what we showed is that P21 is a direct target, uh, ends up interacting with NRF2, which is a master regulator of glutathione regulatory genes. That displaces an inhibitor, KEEP1, and then that leads to an elevated level of the glutathione pathway, which is essentially what gets rid of chemotherapeutics or nasty drugs and what gets rid of reactive oxygen species. And so in this way, basically the tumor initiating cells receiving a TGF-beta signal end up protected from uh, chemotherapy. And in addition, if we look at the human database, what we find is that the cohort of patients that have high levels of glutathione gene expression turn out to be doing the poorest with regards to prognosis for squamous cell carcinoma. So we've also then in the last couple of years looked at um, immunotherapy as well, in particular the equivalent of say CAR T therapy or, uh, or cytotoxic T cell transfer therapy. And this is the work of Phoenix Miao who is a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory. And with regards to this, we essentially took advantage of existing mice. There's a mouse that basically can uh, uh, generate cytotoxic T cells that will attack a cell if it has, or if it's expressing an OVA1 antigen on its surface. And so effectively what we did is generate a mouse harboring an inducible OVA1 that uh, was packaged into our lentivirus. And in this case, what we wanted to do was to put the OVA1 under control of a tetracycline regulatory element so that effectively, once you induce tumor formation, you cannot shut off OVA1 because uh, Tyler Jacks had done similar kinds of exper experiments. And what he found was that those cells that evaded immunotherapy were effectively those cells that silenced the tumor oncogene or the tumor antigen, and we didn't want that to happen in our system.
And so then effectively we did these experiments and if we now generate cytotoxic T cells, those T cells come in and they attack the uh, tumor and indeed, the bulk of the tumor disappears within uh, a matter of a week or so. But there's tumor cells that basically we cannot get rid of that stay under the radar screen in this kind of dormant state. Eventually, the tumor always relapses. And so at first, we wanted to look at why the tumor is relapsing. And we thought, well, maybe it's just our cytotoxic T cells. Maybe we don't have them anymore, so we added CD8 antibody to get rid of the cytotoxic T cells and bang, the tumor grows back right away. So it's not that we don't have the cytotoxic T cells around, and indeed we can add another dose of cytotoxic T cells, and we still cannot obliterate those remaining lingering cells. And so if we look at who are those cells, those cells too are the TGF beta responding stem cells. And uh, I won't go through those data, but effectively similar lines to what I just mentioned to you. We look at who are the cells that are surviving and the level of even one week after the T cell treatment, those remaining cells comprise about 25% of them are the tumor initiating uh, TGF beta responding stem cells going up from less than 2% to the total tumor and we lineage trace them, and those are the cells that are responsible for immunotherapy relapse. So uh, how do they work? What are they doing now to evade immune attack? Do they silence the OVA antigen? Uh, do they express PDL1? Do they reduce the major histocompatibility machinery? Fortunately, they don't silence the tumor antigen, which is good. Um, we created mice that shouldn't. Some squamous cell carcinoma stem cells do express PDL1, but others don't, and I'm showing you one that doesn't. So PDL1 is out of the question here. We did show that the tumor initiating stem cells reduce their level of protein synthesis, and so MHC class 1 is downregulated by about fourfold in these tumor initiating stem cells. That probably uh, comprises part of the problem, but for those of you who looked ahead, as my slides were going down, or the words were going down, that basically it turns out that the TGF beta responding stem cells are hijacking yet another mechanism that immune cells normally use to crosstalk with each other. And in this case, it turns out to be CD80, which turns out to be important. We've, it interacts with CTLA4 in this case to dampen down the cytotoxic T cell response and to effectively spare the uh, the tumor initiating stem cells from attack. And um, we demonstrated its functional significance with regards to CRISPR Cas technology. So I'd just like to finish then. I realize time is late, but let me just finish with the last brief vignette, and that deals with this issue of how do stem cells cope with inflammatory stress. But effectively, the broader question here is really that. I've been talking about the importance of tumor microenvironment and the importance of epigenetics and chromatin landscaping and, and how the two are coordinated. And that really leads to this global question of once a stem cell, whatever it is, whether it's tumorigenic or whether it's normal, once it experiences these external environmental cues and changes, how long do those epigenetic landscape changes last when you switch the media or change the environment. Um, and so that, we really decided to return to normal stem cells and, uh, and in this case, deal with inflammatory stress. And what we're interested in is this general principle that we've known for a long time with inflammatory skin disorders or inflammatory bowel disorders or you name it, that basically once the stem cells or once the cell's tissue receives an inflammatory stress the first time, it sort of comes and goes, and that's the end of it. The next time might be later, and it comes, and when it comes, it often comes back in the same spot and often comes back with a vengeance. And that then continues to build up. And so if we give a mouse a naive wound, the wound will heal at a certain rate. If we let it repair and effectively let the tissue go back to normal, we give it a wound in the same spot, the wound always heals faster the next time around. 
And it doesn't matter whether it's a wound, we can give it a psoriatic inducing stimulus, we can give it an atopic dermatitis inducing stimulus, we can give it yeast infection as a stimulus or tumor promoting agent. And in all cases, the cells are sensitized to having seen this toxic uh, agent or inflammatory agent before. And that's something that people have traditionally thought of as being the immune system. The immune system builds up memory. Uh, a, a, in B or T cell therapy, of course, there's rearrangement of the receptor that allows the, uh, the cell to, to, to recognize a pathogen when it sees it again. But in this case, we showed that we could eliminate uh, the B and T cells. We could eliminate uh, a certain type of uh, immune cell that is known to be able to mount a inflammatory response in psoriasis. Uh, macrophages, which Ruslan Medzitov has shown, have uh, epigenetic memory. And in all of these cases, the wounds still healed faster in the absence of these other immune components. It doesn't mean that the immune cells are relevant. They clearly are relevant, but it means that whatever this memory is, it can stand alone in the absence of, uh, of the immune cells. And so we looked at the epigenetics, and to make a long story short, we showed that even six months after we gave the animal an inflammatory assault, that there are chromatin marks that are still open that were open six months earlier. Not many of them, there's only a small handful of them, but they are still there, and that small handful amounts to about 2,000 chromatin peaks. Those chromatin peaks end up having inflammatory memory because we can do that experiment to test that. We can cut out those chromatin domains, and here are five different examples of them in no inflammation, no activity, and now you add topical imic mode uh, treatment and the activity turns on. So these chromatin elements that are sitting there lingering long after the inflammation has resided have chromatin, have inflammation sensing activity. They turn out also to confer to those genes that they are associated with to have more rapid response and we've demonstrated that by virtue of RNA-seq and wound repair. And, uh, and we've also demonstrated that many of those genes that are associated with these peaks are important in cholesterol biosynthesis pathways. And that gets me back to the wall because cholesterol biosynthesis is important in repairing the barrier. It's also important in wound migration. And so, uh, and so these um, memories seem to be memories with an evolutionary purpose. Um, I'm gonna, the time is late, but our idea here, I'll just show you the model. The idea that is based on our ATAC sequencing so far suggests that, again, when we look at these regulatory elements, we find vestiges of not only the stem cell transcription factors, but also the DNA effectors. In this case, we know that the chromatin only opens up after the first inflammatory response. That presumably allows the inflammatory transcription factors to bind, and that basically, we think, is making them accessible, these open chromatin domains now accessible for the binding of the stem cell factors, which now, in the interim, can keep the chromatin in a primed or poised state for uh, the more rapid binding of an inflammatory transcription factor the next time around. And we're testing this model. And we have a number of other questions. Um, is there chronic inflammation? What happens in aging? Uh, is memory cumulative? Uh, is it just epigenetic changes? Are there DNA methylation changes involved? Um, and uh, so on and so forth. Does the malignancy predispose the tissue to malignant transformation? And what about Western diet? It's recently been shown that uh, memory in stem cells, in hematopoietic stem cells in this case, uh, can be influenced by Western diet with um, uh, inflammatory memory associated. So hopefully what I've done today in a rather quick uh, introduction and um, uh, transition through the work that my laboratory has been doing um, convince you of the powers of skin as a model system for studying. Uh, it's much more beautiful than anything you're thinking about now, so please join us on board.
And uh, these are the people really responsible for the work I talked about. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, Phoenix Miao for the inflammatory studies. And I don't, maybe I don't, whoops, that, that came off. Uh, Stephanie Ellis is the person who did the work on the cell competition and my inflammatory crew and my chromatin crew. And with that in mind, I apologize for your, uh, uh, for taking time over, but um, appreciate your patience. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.